What are the most iconic Woman Love Woman films out there? The ones that have entered into the zeitgeist of Woman Love Woman representation. The ones that you can point to and say, yes, these films are a must watch. While I by no means am an authority, I'm making a sort of starter pack of films and television that I think are the quintessential Woman Love Woman content that anyone wanting to get an education in sapphic film and television should check out. Naturally, this means that some, but not all of the content I'll be covering has been mentioned on other lists that I've made. Okay, let's start with comedy films. Starting with rom-coms, we have a small but beloved collection of films that range from the pretty generic genre film to something a little bit more nuanced. So let's start with the good old Imagine Me and You. This is probably the most mainstream rom-com genre film out there with characters and plot that immediately feel familiar because it's following that generic blueprint we expect. It's a film you probably feel like you've seen a hundred times before. You get everything from the meet-cute through to the climactic public declaration, except this time it's also gay, which makes it so much better. And given how few we have of these, it earns a spot on the Woman Love Woman must-watch list. Also a film I've mentioned before, and a more indie outing, Saving Face has also become an iconic rom-com film for the Woman Love Woman community. At its core, it's a coming-out story for protagonist Will, who is struggling to assume her sexuality, coming from a more conservative Chinese immigrant family, and the tension it ultimately causes in her romance with Vivian. Its central conflict is relatable for how it deals with the tension of living truthfully or living a lie, and gives us some likeable characters in a solid script. Like Imagine Me and You, it offers the satisfaction of the feel-good rom-com formula. I Can't Think Straight follows Layla and Tala, who meet as Tala is about to get married for the fourth time. Feelings begin to brew between them that culminate when they end up on a shopping weekend for the wedding. But Tala is not ready to face what this actually means for her as she comes from a conservative family, even if Layla is ready to step into her own truth. Breaking it off, Tala tries to forget about what happened, but, well, it's not that easy. While the script could have, in my opinion, done it with a bit more refinement, it's a beloved classic film that I know a lot of people love. It's only been a few months, and already the film Crush is, in my mind, a total classic. It's the teen rom-com that we deserve, based in a world where there be a lot of gay women, homophobia doesn't exist, and it's all about realising that the girl you've been crushing on since forever maybe isn't the one for you. No. Instead, it's the twin sister, who you've been forced to get tutored by, and it turns out that she's a pretty amazing person. There is no great big bad. It's sweet, funny, and wonderfully acted. It's the kind of film that I think is important for young queer people to have growing up, just like our straight counterparts have. Is this a rom-com, or is it a drama? Eh, well, I'm putting it here. Back before Laurel Holman took on the role as Tina in The L Word, she made a foray into queer cinema history with the incredible adventure of Two Girls in Love. Here she plays the baby butch Randy living with her gay aunt and girlfriend and working at the gas station after school. One day she gets talking with Evie when while at work and it leads to them developing a friendship that slides into something more. Along with it comes all the trials that figuring out who they are is and how to be together while living in a community that isn't necessarily that accepting. It's a sweet indie film that speaks to where the queer narrative was back in the 90s and it's an important queer film to see. This delightful and well-made film follows Ricky, a trans bisexual woman who is living in a small town. She is set on going to fashion school, but as she waits to hear back about her application for study, she hangs out with her best friend Robbie and works as a barista at a cafe. When Francesca walks in, a relationship blossoms. This film makes the list for two reasons. It's a delightful film, which alone earns it a spot, but it's also an incredibly rare film that features a trans protagonist. So I say, go watch it. But I'm a Cheerleader is a campy satire which is beloved in the queer community. It follows Megan, who is carted off to conversion camp when her conservative family stages an intervention because she doesn't enjoy kissing her all-American boyfriend and prefers to stare at her fellow cheerleaders instead. Realising that she is a homosexual, she throws herself into becoming straight, but she doesn't count on falling in love with her fellow campmate Graham. While the story is sweet and pretty tame, at the time it came out, the movie was seen as too unabashedly queer, and it was panned for its garish colour scheme, which was all part of the narrative around sexuality and gender constructs forced on us by society. It's since built a niche fan base amongst the LGBTQ, and it really is a must-see.
Speaking of campy, Debs is a spy comedy romp where a sorority of spies in training get embroiled with the known supervillain Lucy Diamond. Amy, one of the spies in training, has always been intrigued by Lucy, is doing a thesis on her, and so when she comes face to face with her, instead of apprehending her, they chit-chat and Lucy gets away. Lucy is now also intrigued and decides she wants to help Amy write this thesis, but really what she wants is a date. And well, they get closer. This movie, with its over-the-top green screen CGI and simplistic script, was a flop when it first came out, but has since burrowed its way into the woman love woman zeitgeist for exactly that reason. It's a silly film that does what it's meant to do, entertain us while serving us with a good dollop of gay. Films I wouldn't call rom-coms per se, but they are comedies that have lesbian love in them. Based on historical accounts, the star-studded dark comedy is quite unlike any other on the list. Abigail and Sarah are cousins, who are manoeuvring within the court politics and vying to be the invalid Queen Anne's favourite. And while Sarah seems to have a genuine, if exacting, love for Queen Anne, Abigail is doing it for selfish reasons and she's not above using false flattery and seduction to reach her goal. It's a complex story with many layers that centres this kind of love triangle between three fascinating historical women, and while it isn't a fairy tale romance by any means, it really is a must-see. Booksmart is a coming-of-age buddy rom-com where Amy and Molly are determined to finish out high school by doing all the shenanigans they never got up to because they were too busy studying. They decide to party. Amy is also gay and she decides to do something about that to mixed results. This is a really good movie with excellent cast and a smart script, a rare gem of a gay movie. Moving on to musicals, and quite honestly, I don't know a lot of musicals with lesbian stories centred at the heart, but this is what I've got for you. The Prom is a screen adaptation of the stage musical where Broadway stars, off the back of a play that flopped, decide to take up a cause. When they hear about how Emma's prom has been cancelled by the PTA because she wants to bring a girl as her date, they set out to help her with plenty of razzle-dazzle. It's a fun film and it's a star-studded cast. It does run a bit long in my opinion, but the finale number did get me all emotional and it's really the only lesbian-centred musical film that I know of. Because while Rent precedes the prom with lesbians in it, they are not the protagonist of that story. What it does have is Adina Menzel, the star of the very subtexty musical Wicked, as a bisexual Maureen who has a girlfriend. It doesn't get a whole heap of screen time, but it's there, and given how anemic this portion of my list is, it makes the cut. If you're into musicals, this popular musical is well worth a watch. Let's start with the thriller and horror genres. A genre that is not particularly my cup of tea, so I don't mean to suggest that the following few films are the only ones that should have made it onto this list. These are just the ones that I know of and I think that are worth checking out. Thelma is a supernatural thriller where Thelma begins to manifest strange powers when she feels an attraction to a girl at her university. Only this isn't the first time she's manifested these powers, but without her ability to control them, it's her emotions that are in control, with potentially deadly consequences. It looks at the idea of repressed feelings that I'm sure most queer people can relate to, and it's such a well-done film that does a good job of growing that disquiet tension. Highly recommended. This biographical crime drama follows the female serial killer Aileen Wumos, a prostitute that kills a client when he attempts to rape her, which she confesses to her girlfriend. Feeling justified in the killing of these men that exploit women, she doesn't stop there. This film received critical acclaim for Shalise Theron's incredible portrayal of Aileen with her borderline personality disorder, so although I don't know that this is everyone's cup of tea from a woman love woman perspective, because let's just say it doesn't end well, it's one of those films that made a real impact in the mainstream with lesbians at its centre and it is a really good film. Peter Jackson's breakthrough film Heavenly Creatures is based on a real life story of two teen girls who develop an obsessive relationship that turns dark when the parents, concerned, try to pull them apart. They are not there for that and instead hatch a plan to get rid of Pauline's mother. It's a twisted tale with strong echoes of Peter Jackson's earlier work in horror. It's certainly not positive representation, but it's a fascinating interpretation of what was going on in the minds of these girls, and in all honesty, this echoes the type of framing lesbian representation was getting back in the day. 
which is such a different kind of take from the Fair trilogy based off the book series where part one and two centre around a lesbian love story. In part one, Dina and Sam recently broke up because Sam is not ready to be out of the closet, but their feelings are still very present. So when there is a murder spree by what is considered to be the curse of the witch from centuries before, Sarah Fryer, Dina and Sam are drawn together. In the third part, we get to see what led to the events of the curse, which has a strong sapphic thread running through it. This has elements of body horror and slasher in it, and while it isn't my thing, the gay stuff is, and I think that this movie stands out within the genre. It's weird, it's twisted, and it doesn't necessarily make total sense, but at its centre this film is about a young girl coming to Hollywood hoping for stardom and gets embroiled in the mystery of who her new friend Rita is. And there is definitely a sapphic overtone to the relationship. It's a mind-bending foray to stimulate the mind with two attractive women at the centre. I think that makes it essential viewing. Bound is a neo-noir thriller directed by none other than the Wachowski sisters of the Matrix fame and follows Violet who is desperate to get away from her mafioso boyfriend. When she meets Corky, an ex-con, Violet is immediately drawn to her. They begin an affair and along with it, a plan to run away together. But not before they steal a couple of million dollars. It's a sexy film and the leads have excellent chemistry and you just know that if the Wachowski sisters are at the helm, it's going to be a good film. Moving on to dramas, while it's very problematic having a teacher and a student in a relationship, we suffics don't seem to care too much and so Loving Annabelle has made its way into classicdom. It's got that mid-2000 indie vibe about it where Annabelle comes to a new school and sets her eyes on the teacher, who, against her better judgement, returns those feelings. But yeah, it won't end well because they get discovered and there are consequences. A less problematic age gap because at least they are both adults here, Carol of course had to make it onto this list. Based on a novel that had the distinction of being the first lesbian story in fiction to give us a happy ending, it's a sumptuous movie that lingers in the emotions of the affair between Carol and Therese with beautiful shots, lingering gazes and a palpable connection between the leads. When Carol forgets her glove, I would say on purpose, at the department store that Therese works at, they connect and a slow burn romance develops. However, Carol is married and the custody of her child is at stake. With the critical acclaim that this movie got, it's a film that wasn't just popular with the woman love woman crowd, but with mainstream too. Similarly, Portrait of a Lady on Fire received critical acclaim for its fresh take on the lesbian period drama. It's a film that tries to throw off the typical conflict narrative pervasive in Western filmmaking and lingered in the space not often explored, making it something interesting not just to the queer audience but to mainstream too. Moving into a very different realm of film, The Truth About Jane was a lifetime made-for-TV movie which, at the time it came out, had a powerful impact on its Woman Love Woman audience. It follows Jane, who realises that she's different when she falls for a girl, but her mother doesn't take it well. It's a film that dwells in the coming-out narrative that perhaps today may seem very done, but at the time it had real resonance, and I think it still holds an important place in cinematic history and for people who are still experiencing these issues in their their own lives today. Yolanda is a studious girl from a strict background who strikes up a friendship with the girl who moves in next door. Their feelings deepen, leading to jealousies that threaten their relationship. This is the kind of coming-of-age film that is quiet and unassuming, but below the surface of what isn't spoken, there is an undertow of powerful emotion that swirls between the girls. It's a beautiful film, well done and well worth a watch. Desert Hearts was a groundbreaking film for its time. While The Price of Salt was the first book to give a happy ending, for films it was Desert Hearts in 1985. Set in the 1950s, Vivian is coming off a divorce and in need of a change of scenery. In doing so, she comes across the young and wild Kay. There is a chemistry between them, and while it's scary and new, it's something that she ultimately wants to explore. It's a film that is a pleasure to watch, seminal in the lesbian film canon. Rated as one of my personal top films of all time, Fire is a story of two sister-in-laws who are in loveless relationships. When Sita arrives on the back of her arranged marriage, only to find that her husband is in love and having a relationship with a woman his family would never approve of, she turns to Radha for comfort. Radha has been married for years, but her husband is practicing celibacy, something she's put up with. With their developing attachment, the two women find solace in each other. 
It's such a beautiful film, layered with rich themes about rebirth, passion and love, and, in my opinion, a must-watch. I dubiously put this movie on this list because it's not a film I personally like, but it did receive a lot of mainstream attention at Cannes at the time due to its pretty graphic sex scenes. While I feel it was pretty exploitative and full of the male gaze, it is to some people's taste, and it may be to yours. Either way, it's a rare film that has broken out beyond the cloistered sphere of lesbian cinema, and for that, I guess it's essential watching. Which is also how I feel about The Handmaiden, an adaptation of the book Fingersmith by queer author Sarah Waters. There are a lot of people in the community who love this film, but again, not so much my vibe. It revolves around Suki, who is roped into posing as a handmaiden for Lady Haidako in order to trick her mistress into the madhouse. Only the two girls fall in love and, well, that changes everything. While it's clearly based off the novel, it diverges in some key ways. I did a video about what my issues with The Handmaiden are, so click on that title card if you're curious. Having said that, I do think that, like Blue is the Warmest Colour, it is a film that is essential viewing if you want a comprehensive education in Woman Love Woman Cinema. A much more palatable movie to my taste is the half of it. While this is explicitly framed as not a love story but one of friendship, it follows Ellie and how her friendship with Paul finds her writing love letters on his behalf to the girl that she also has a crush on. Made by Alice Wu, who also made Saving Face, featured in part one of the series, this is a wonderful coming-of-age movie that deserves a spot on this list. This indie outing follows Cheryl, an aspiring filmmaker who is working in a video store and is making a documentary about black actresses in early films who were often admitted from credits and frequently were relegated to the mammy role. Through her research, she uncovers an actress who is credited only as the watermelon woman and she's determined to find out who this actress was. As she works on this documentary, she also meets and starts a relationship with Diana. It's a seminal movie for black representation in Woman Love Woman film at a time when the few voices were almost uniquely white. This powerful film follows baby butch Alike who is struggling under the confines of the expectation of her family. Forced to hide who she is, it is a journey of fully stepping into her queerness and taking control of her life, even if her family can't and won't support who she is and her dreams. A powerful film. While there isn't a lot of Woman Love Woman content that predates the 1980s, there are a few films that do touch on sapphic themes, and while it's to be expected that they don't end well because everything pre-1985 wasn't a happy ending, they still are worth a watch. When two best friends and teachers who run a private school are falsely accused of being lesbians by a bratty student, the rumours quickly spread and threatened not just their livelihood but their relationships. The thing is, is that the rumour is not entirely unfounded because one of them, in fact, is harbouring a secret, one that she can barely admit even to herself. It stars the stunning Audrey Hepburn and Shirley MacLaine in a powerful film. It doesn't end well, but it is essential viewing. Also set in a boarding school, this film is full of so much lesbian under, over and through tones. Honestly, is everyone gay in this film? I'm not complaining. Olivia, the new student, arrives where two of the teachers are pitted against each other in a very sapphic way and where students have picked sides. Olivia quickly becomes a favourite of Mademoiselle Cara and in return Olivia begins to fall for her. This film seems to be pretty heavily influenced by the next film I'm about to discuss. This is credited as being the first lesbian film and yes it is from 1931. Before the haze codes that put a real dampener on queer film making, this bold film adapted from a stage play follows Manuela as she arrives at a new school. Like most of her fellow students, she quickly develops a fondness for Fräulein von Bernberg, but her feelings take a deeper bent. Her feelings overwhelm her and it all comes to a head. There is also a 1958 version of the film which is my personal favourite of the two, but both of these films I feel are essential watching. When Night is Falling is a 1995 Canadian film which is something of a classic in sapphic cinema. It follows Camille who was on the cusp of becoming a university chaplain provided she marries her boyfriend, but something inside her rebels, especially when she meets the intriguing Petra. Through a deliberate laundry mix-up on Petra's behalf, Camille crosses paths with her again and is drawn into a world far removed from stuffy religious academia and it stirs something unexpected and new in her. It's got some lovely sensuality to the film, and while it's not to everyone's taste, getting mixed reviews, it's a film that is often commented on by you guys 
so I felt like it should be part of this essential lesbian list. Less popular, but a film I enjoyed much more, is Liana. From its release date, you know it's not a happy ending, but neither is it an unhappy one. It's closer to real life, which is to say it's nuanced. With the Hays Code more than a decade defunct, this film is able to follow Liana as she comes into her queerness without villainizing her, but instead shows the rise and the fall of the love affair that helps her assume her sexuality and explores the impact it has on her life and her family's life when she's forced to leave the home. It avoids falling into overwrought sentimentality or wallowing in the melodrama, which I liked, and instead allows the moments of the film to exist without hitting you over the head with its narrative. In so doing, it feels less like a sad ending and more like the beginning of a journey, and feels true to what a reality as a queer woman looked like in the early 80s in the US. This 2018 indie film is one I've been meaning to watch for the longest time. I finally did, and I'm glad. This is a rare, rare film that looks at the Suffolk experience from the Kenyan perspective. It's summer and Kenna is waiting for the results of her exams, which will determine what she can study at university. As she waits, she works at her father's store and hangs out with her friends. Her dad is running for office, so when the daughter of the opposition catches her eye, it's doubly forbidden. Nonetheless, the two girls develop a relationship, but they can't keep it hidden for long. While the story is simple, it's a beautiful movie with excellent performances, especially from Samantha Mugatsia, who plays Kenna. What makes this especially satisfying as a sapphic film is that while the reality of being a queer woman in Kenya is not glossed over, it's still a film of triumph and hope, not queer torture porn as it could easily have become. I was charmed, and I won't lie, a little relieved at the story. This Swedish film follows the social outcast Agnes and how she is drawn to the popular wild Elin. On the surface, they couldn't be more different, but they discover they may have more in common than they thought. One night, Elin is dared to kiss Agnes to prove that she's a lesbian, but afterwards regrets it and comes back to apologize. To make up for it, she invites Agnes to a party, and on the way there they discover that they, in fact, like each other. Only this discovery is difficult to reconcile. It has that indie European sensibility, and the performances are charming. The chemistry is good, which makes this a gem in the coming of a genre. I think it's an essential Suffolk film to watch. Amy and Jaguar is a film that has been nominated quite frequently by you all in comments as a favourite lesbian film. It's based on a true story and was adapted from a book. Set in 1943 Berlin, Lily, the bored housewife of a Nazi, finds herself the object of Felice's attention, a Jewish woman who has gone undercover for the resistance working for a Nazi newspaper. Felice begins sending love letters to her, but Lily is already having an affair and finding it lacking. When her husband, while back on leave from the army, is discovered with another woman, she realizes she's not in love with him and begins an intense affair with Felice. Felice is at risk of discovery by the Gestapo, however, and things only intensify when the husband comes to visit unexpectedly. This film gets a spot because it explores a real-life example of what it was like to be a sapphic during that time period. This film anthology is the follow-up to the original 1996 made-for-TV film If These Walls Could Talk, which looked at three different stories of women needing abortion through different time periods of the 20th century. It was successful enough to get a part two four years later. It followed the same formula, but this time looked at three stories about sapphic women in 1961, 1972, and 2000. The cast is jam-packed full of actresses you'll recognize starting with Vanessa Redgrave in the 1961 segment, Michelle Williams and Chloe Sevigny with Natasha Lyonne and Nia Long making an appearance in the 1972 segment, and then Ellen DeGeneres and Sharon Stone in the 2000 segment. I may be biased with the inclusion of this one because back in the early 2000s, as I was coming out, it left a lasting impression. It felt like a powerful look at the impact that progress had had on queer lives. Even if the 2000 version wanted to depict a comparatively utopian look at being queer, despite it still being a very homophobic time, and continues to be in most of the world today. Let me know if you think this deserves to be on this list. I felt mixed after watching this film back when it came out in 2011, but after some thought, I felt like it deserved to be on this list. 
Why? Because it delves into the world of Tehran, Iran, under a repressive regime, and through that lens explores what it meant for Atafir and Shireen to have feelings for each other, the straining at such tightly wound control, and was inspired by director Miriam Keshavar's experience visiting as an adolescent. It was such a radical film that it was banned in Iran, and Miriam Keshavar has been banned from ever returning to the country. The ending is not deadly, but it is tragic in its own way because it is, I imagine, realistic to what many queer people have to face in countries where being a woman and being queer robs you of all autonomy. And that is why it's on this list. The Colour Purple is an amazing film which deserves a mention even if the gayness of the protagonist, Celie, is dialed way back from the book it was adapted from. Much like Fried Green Tomatoes, another film that is also worth watching. I imagine the choice to dial the lesbianism way back was to appeal to wider audiences given the mainstream sentiments of 1985, which was the same year Desert Hearts came out with its first ever happy ending for a sapphic couple. While the story is much grander in scope than just Sally's sexuality, it was also pivotal to her character arc, so it is present in the movie in the form of a beautiful scene between Sally and Shug, but it's not taken any further than that, and it's up to us as the audience to read the deeper impact of the the scene on the narrative. Other honourable mentions based off movies often nominated by you in the comment section are High Art, where a woman meets a renowned photographer and begins to fall for her, The World Unseen, where two Indian South African women fall in love in a racist, sexist and homophobic society, if you've watched I Can't Think Straight you've probably seen this one too, and Water Lilies, following the sexual awakening of a 15 year old over the course of a summer. Let's talk TV shows. We've covered essential films that everyone wanting an education in sapphic cinema should watch in the first part of this series. Now let's turn to TV and look at notable TV episodes and TV series with sapphic representation that I think everyone should check out. Before TV shows introduced regular sapphic characters, there was the gay episode, and there are a few that I think that everyone should check out. The Golden Girls is a beloved classic comedy show and one that is popular with the LGBTQ community. One of the reasons for this is due to its willingness back in the wilderness of the 80s to trailblaze by touching on queer topics. It did this in the 1986 episode Isn't It Romantic when Jean, Dorothy's friend, comes to stay after her partner Pat has died. The times being what they were, Dorothy let the rest of the household assume that Pat was a man as it seemed irrelevant. But when Jean finds herself attracted to Rose, it causes a light-hearted kerfuffle. Why this episode stands out is that the show doesn't pass judgement on Jean's sexuality and the jokes are joyfully non-homophobic. It's not an episode that dives into the queer experience by any means and honestly feels like it was made more for the straight audience than the gay one, but it's one of the first positive sapphic portrayals in television. If you happen to know of any positive portrayals that predates this, please let me know in the comments. While there are other woman love woman moments of note between 1986 and 1995 that I'll cover in my next video on the history of sapphic film and TV, the next piece of content that I think everyone should watch is from the Star Trek franchise. Deep Space Nine decided to explore a same-sex storyline in the episode Rejoined, where the main character of Jadzia Dax meets her wife from a previous lifetime. Jadzia is a trill, which is a humanoid species which is joined with the symbiont Dax, essentially a, a slug-like creature that can pass through multiple trill hosts over the length of its lifetime. When a symbiont changes host, they retain their memory, but it is expected that all ties to the previous life is cut, which includes not rekindling any relationships. It is, in fact, deeply taboo and will result in excommunication from the Trill Society. However, when Dax's wife from a previous life, Dr. Lanara Khan, turns up on Deep Space Nine for work, all the emotions come flooding back for both of them so strongly that they can't ignore it. The parable for the gay experience is obvious in this sci-fi setup, even though them both being in a female body isn't mentioned. What makes this episode stand out is that while they had been lesbian kisses on TV before, this one wasn't just a peck on the lips, as you can see. Nor was it a sweepstakes stunt as was popular in the 90s for ratings. Also, I do enjoy a bit of Star Trek as you may already know from my video essay on why Janeway and Seven make a logical couple on Star Trek Voyager. So, I think it's essential viewing. 
The puppy episode on the sitcom Ellen is a seminal moment in the history of Sapphic TV where the character of Ellen Morgan comes out on the sitcom at the same time as Ellen DeGeneres comes out in real life. It was deeply impactful on queer representation, both paving the way and scaring the queer community at how savage the backlash was. The ratings plummeted and the show was cancelled at the end of the fifth season, which did mean that the show got to explore how Ellen stepped into her sexuality over an entire season, so there is that. However, Ellen DeGeneres struggled to find work for years after and Laura Dern, who played the love interest in the puppy episode, despite coming off the wildly successful Jurassic Park, didn't work for a year and a half afterwards. The show had been teasing Ellen's coming out through the fourth season and took that final step out of the closet when Ellen meets and has an immediate affinity with the lesbian Susan. She realizes that she's been repressing an important part of herself and ends up coming out. Let's move on to TV series. If you've been following my channel, you will not be surprised to see this one on the list. Xena was a historical fantasy show about a warrior who, with her sidekick Gabrielle, roamed the Greek countryside seeking redemption from her evil warlording ways. It was a show that was dealing with some dark themes, but also had no problem switching to straight up comedy episodes. She was amongst the new wave of fleshed out female protagonists of the 90s, along with characters like Dana Scully of The X-Files and Catherine Janeway of Star Trek Voyager. And I've heard say that Xena was part of the inspiration for another series on this list, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. What's so gay about the show? Well, pretty much everything. She and Gabrielle quickly became lesbian icons. While the show could never explicitly come out and say that Xena and Gabby were a couple, the show went to all lengths to show that they were, and in so doing, garnered an army of loyal Xena fans that continue even today. If you're curious, I've made a series going over their gayest moments, so check out the playlist in the title cards at the top of the screen. Now, while the backlash was intense with Ellen's coming out, it did open the way for the next wave of lesbian representation. No longer cloistered to special episodes or to subtext, the next major woman love woman storyline to grace the TV screen was Willow and Tara on Buffy the Vampire Slayer starting in season four. Willow had previously been in a relationship with the guy, but after that ended, a romance blossomed when she met Tara at university and they became a long-term couple on the show. It offered an opportunity to see the two women meet and grow closer, unlike previous explicit representation where there was little to no build-up, which makes this groundbreaking and garnered a lot of dedicated fans. It took a while for them to kiss, until season 5, and while sex was implied, the closest we got to one was a euphemistic musical number. The ending was pretty traumatic for the couple in season 6, playing into all the worst tropes, but it still deserves a spot on this list for trailblazing the way it did. And then came the L word in all its sapphic glory, following the lives of a close-knit group of lady-loving ladies in LA. It was unabashed, blazing through all the tentative censored stories that had come before. It depicted a queer reality that was both affirming and aspirational, with no cares for how a straight homophobic audience would react. It centered queer lives and was clearly made for queer women, rather than it being about educating conservative audiences, or the story being muzzled by fears of reactions from conservative audiences. Audiences. And it had more than just a queer character. The vast majority of the characters were queer and they were out and proud. It's not a perfect show by any stretch. It pandered to the male gaze with lots of explicit sex scenes and faulted badly in some areas, especially in its attempt to portray a trans character. But if I had to pick just one iconic sapphic show from this list, this would have to be it. I debated on which to go with, South of Nowhere or Sugar Rush. They both came out at the same time, both with teen protagonists who are dealing with their sexuality and being in love with their best friends. In the end, I think both are important shows. I know South of Nowhere had a huge impact on the teens of the 2000s era, and I know Spashley was a major ship. I was surprised at how unabashedly they dealt with Spencer's coming out journey, which was a first from the teen perspective, and therefore a milestone in Sapphic TV. What I liked less was the OCCW vibe where everyone is gorgeous and teens interact like many adults. Also, they were clearly censored once they got together and the show kind of lost me with its constant on and off again drama. Sugar Rush was a more offbeat show which ultimately was more my vibe. I thought it did a better job at capturing the emotional world of the teenager, the feelings of first love and the general messiness of figuring out who you are. It also let Kim have sexual desire and while it wasn't much more explicit than South of Nowhere, I didn't feel 
feel like they were being censored in the same way. It also centered Kim completely. This was not an ensemble cast with multiple other storylines going on. Sugar Rush had a single sapphic protagonist, which means the entire show was about her, which I appreciated. I could have nominated Beth from the soap Brookside as the first major lesbian storyline on a soap in 1994 or Bianca Montgomery from All My Children, but for a few reasons Otalia gets my vote. One of them is entirely biased, it was my first sapphic ship, but also because as a storyline this pairing holds up. It had its issues with intense censorship that prevented a proper romantic kiss, some frankly annoying story elements, especially near the end, but it also spent two years carefully developing this love story in a way that felt so genuine. There is nothing rushed about how these two got together and gave the best enemies to love a storyline I've ever seen. The chemistry was so on point and the acting from the two ladies was superb. And the best thing is is that the channel Flying Witch has been collating the entire storyline from the start in a few long videos for easy viewing. If you want to skip most of the lead up, start with part two. One of TV's most popular and longest running TV shows, Grey's Anatomy, introduced the character of Arizona Robbins, an out lesbian who started a romance in season 5 with Kelly Torres, an established character. It dealt with issues like Kelly coming out as bisexual through to marriage, a car crash, an amputated limb and having a child together, and was one of the most visible long-term sapphic couples on network TV at the time until their breakup in season 11. It's one of those shows that helped normalize the presence of queerness on screen because it was watched by so many people, unlike more obscure shows like The L Word, which is renowned within the community but not necessarily outside of it. It was a very popular ship with the Woman Love Woman fandom. The relationship got pretty messy near the end, but it's still an important couple in queer representation. Something else that was super messy was Glee. It didn't start out with any sapphic characters, but did drop a few hints that Santana and Brittany might be hooking up. Audiences really responded to that, asking for it to be made official and, in a rare turn of events, the show did just that, going as far as to having the couple marry in the final season. There was also, of course, the epic subtext ship of Faberi, which is also part of sapphic film and TV history. But that aside, you may be wondering why this show is making an appearance giving the huge turn in popularity it suffered in later seasons. It started out as fresh, irreverent, sharp and fun with its snappy dialogue, outrageous stories and musical numbers, but by the end these same things felt like limp letters. That is to say, deeply unpalatable. The ending, however, doesn't change that in the beginning it was a show that celebrated the outcast, those who were different, which is why it connected so strongly with queer youth at the time. Time, and so it's on this list. The Fosters heralded the breaking of new ground. It took the family drama show and instead of a mum and dad gave the family two mums in the shape of Steph and Lena. The majority of the drama revolved around the kids but they got their own storyline and they had their own share of couple issues but essentially presented a united stable front for their three children and two foster kids that joined them. The chemistry of the two mums was beautiful and in a landscape where a lot of woman love woman couples revolve around the coming together or the breaking up up, it's nice to have a show where the couple are established and living their everyday lives, something I would guess most of us aspire to. Orange is the New Black was also a cultural phenomenon and one of the original breakout streaming shows. Like Grey's and Glee, the popularity of the show spread far beyond the sapphic community. While the other two shows had straight leads, this one was different in that it had a bisexual woman at the helm and then many more sapphic characters in addition to that. I also have to shout out the landmark character of Sophia Bousset, which was a game changer for trans representation. With the show we got to see a diversity of not just female characters, but of queer female characters, even if I didn't like where a lot of them ended up, but it was a prison show so yeah, I guess I should have expected that. Piper may have technically been the white lead, but let's be real, she ultimately wasn't. She was just the gateway to more diverse storytelling and that makes this an important sapphic show to watch. Ah yes, Klexa. I had to touch on Klexa. 
It took her bisexual lead and had her fall in love with the enemy, more or less, and did this beautiful job of slowly building that relationship in such a way that it garnered thousands of adoring fans who really connected with that storyline. And then, of course, that horrific ending, at the same time as a slew of other unfortunate endings for Woman Love Woman characters in 2016. It ignited a high-profile campaign against the bury your gaze trope and helped put a critical lens on lesbian representation. With that kind of impact, it would be impossible for me to leave this off this list. I am including the show not so much for the wildly popular Supercorp subtext ship, although if you're into subtext ships that don't ever become canon, this is a doozy. Instead, I include it for the coming out story of Alex Danvers in season 2 and the subsequent romance with Maggie Sawyer, until it kind of went pear-shaped because actress Florence Lima had other commitments. But to that point, the writing and the emotional authenticity that actress Kyla Lee brought to Alex's journey makes this a standout coming out story that I think everyone should watch. With the increased representation of Woman Love Woman characters on TV, we got to see more diversity in the types of characters. With Sense8, we finally got a sapphic trans woman on our screens on a major TV show, and with it came the ability to explore new facets of the queer female experience. Important was that this depiction showed an empowered trans character in a loving relationship, a possible vision of what can be in a landscape that often likes to focus on trauma for the benefit of the cis audience. The show was created by the Wachowski sisters, which makes sense since they are both trans women themselves and brought to it not just good representation, but the same mind-bending storytelling that made The Matrix such a phenomenon. At the same time as all the lesbians were dying on TV in 2016, Winona Earp burst onto sapphic screens to reassure women-love-women audiences that it was possible to do sapphic representation right. Winona's sister, Waverly, quickly discovered that she had a thing for Nicole Hort, the local law enforcement. They begin a relationship that isn't without its ups and downs, but throughout the adventure, their love for each other is strong, and the fear that it would end with a dead lesbian was quickly dismissed. It was a show that helped reassure a skittish sapphic fan base that it was possible to create a woman love woman storyline that could end without tragedy, which cannot be said for Killing Eve. While it started out strong with its first season, the subsequent ones were a downhill spiral ending in season 4 which was, to put it succinctly, an absolute disaster. But it's still a show that I think should be on this list, less for it being a good show to watch, although I was good with the first three seasons, but more to see what a train wreck looks like to see how far a show can fall when entrusted to the wrong person. Killing Eve was a certified phenomenon that outstripped any others on this list in popularity, with two female protagonists that were fresh and exciting. The chemistry between them was phenomenal, the tension palpable, and it was mishandled atrociously. I did a critique on how Killing Eve ended, so check that out if you want to go deeper into what went down. A material that was handled with far more care was Gentleman Jack. The mere fact that it was based on a real-life lesbian who left behind detailed diaries of not just her business dealings in coal but her many romantic conquests with women makes it worthy of this list, but added to it was excellent writing, performances and production quality. It challenged our very narrow ideas of what women could be back then. Anne Lister, with the privilege of her wealth, was able to create a remarkable life for herself, one where she was even married to another woman, unofficially of course. The tragedy is, is that it was cancelled before it could tie up its narrative threads, but both as a show and as a slice of history, it's worthy of being on this list. Similarly, A League of Their Own took real-life stories and fictionalised them into this recently released series, although it's far more loosely adapted than Gentleman Jack. It focuses on the lives of women who are playing baseball during the 1940s, around the time that men were at war and a women's baseball league was created to fill the gap they left behind. With a number of queer women attracted to the sport, the show consequently had a heavy queer focus, offering up some diverse representation that has rarely been seen before. Only the L word exceeds the show on the gayness meter. While it explores the reality of race and sexuality for the characters, I also somehow found it a deeply comforting show to watch and I think it's essential viewing. Some other shows that deserve a special mention. First Kill, The Haunting of Bly Manor, Dickinson, The Married Woman, Vida, and Batwoman. Orphan Black showed up a number of times in the comments, and rightly so. It's a gripping show with a great cast. 
The series follows a number of clones, all played by the insanely talented Tatiana Maslany, who, to put this in perspective, was nominated for the show something like 26 times. She did win 14 awards and gained an army of Sapphic fans for the portrayal of Cosima, the genius science nerd who falls for Delphine, a fellow university student. Of course, given that Cosima and her clone sisters are all trying to figure out the mystery of their origin, Delphine's appearance in her life is not as straightforward as it seems. But I won't spoil anything further. Suffice to say that the show created a truly gorgeous storyline for these two, and the chemistry elevated it further. I've talked about them in my TV shows that won't break your heart part one, so I guess I am spoiling something, which is that they have a good ending. Another show I mentioned in part two of my TV shows that won't break your hearts video is Legends of Tomorrow. We weren't given a proper ending with its sudden cancellation, leaving the cliffhanger ending dangling, but where we left Sarah and Ava felt very fitting. Sarah, the leader of a group of misfit superheroes who traveled the time stream to set history right when it went off the rails, initially had an antagonistic relationship with Ava, an agent and eventual director of the Time Bureau. You might guess this, it's an enemies to lovers story, but it doesn't stop there. Through their relationship, we get to explore their characters in depth, which I loved, and in the process created a pairing that gets to transition from relatively slow burn beginnings to an actual healthy relationship. The show is also a delightful romp with plenty of wackiness that doesn't take itself too seriously, which I like, and I warmed to most of the ensemble cast too. It's a comfort show for sure. Remember how all the lesbians were dying in 2016? Well, Lost Girl was one of the few that bucked that trend, and perhaps it was because Emily Andras, executive producer of Winona Earp, was throwing her sapphic fairy dust on the show, and blessing us all with a happy ending at the same time as all the other Woman Love Woman characters were dying off in droves. It follows Bo, a succubus who feeds on sexual energy, only she doesn't know what she is and has been on the run since she killed her boyfriend when having sex for the first time. In search of her identity and exploring her powers, she's drawn into the Fey world and there she meets Lauren, a human doctor, and there is an immediate spark between them that plays out over the series. It's a show that has a strong dose of the family found dynamic, of Bo figuring out her identity, and it's pretty darn gay. Motherland Fort Salem is a show I tried to watch when it first came out, but I don't know, perhaps I wasn't in the right frame of mind, because I found the way they did the world building jarring enough that I dropped it after two episodes, so I have to confess I haven't actually watched this, but based off the comments, it's popular. There is the main sapphic ship of Scylla and Rael, and via Tumblr I've been seeing a lot of gift sets about the subtext ship between Tally and Sarah. We're going strong with the sci-fi and fantasy genres here because this show takes the idea of witches and creates a female-dominated society in which we follow three witches that have been conscripted into the US Army training program where they are learning how to use their voices to create powerful spells. Rael meets Scylla, who is a second year recruit in the Necro Division, so working with dead bodies, and they start something of a forbidden relationship, but Skylar is not all she appears to be. I expect I'll try to rewatch this at some point, although I have one long list of sapphic TV shows and films to watch at the moment, so it might not be for a while. Station 19 is a show that got nominated a few times by you. It's a spin-off of the show Grey's Anatomy and exists in the same universe. Instead of a hospital, it centers around a fire department and its firefighters. It's more serious in tone than Grey's, but retains that familiar Shonda Rhimes vibe. Karina starts out on Grey's Anatomy and was established as queer there. She sees Maya in season 16, episode 14 from afar when Maya drops by the hospital, and they then run into each other in a bar on station 19, season 3, episode 5. From there, a relationship develops. With the tonal shift between the series and the fact that Karina takes on a smaller role in Station 19, I feel we lost a bit of Karina's spiciness, but she is also a wonderfully supportive and loving partner to Maya as she deals with the trauma of growing up with an abusive father, so I get why people love this pairing. They got married after some expected drama, but I have to say that the way the baby storyline was going lost me, and I haven't caught up since. From what I can see though, they're happily married, and I saw the green card interview while researching for this video, and I was cackling. A much less happy show is Wentworth, an Australian prison show that offered up a few different lesbian characters. It's gritty and pretty violent, but also very good. 
at least the first five seasons were and I stopped watching after that because it was 2016 and my OTP ship of Bally got destroyed along with another of my ships that year and I just couldn't bring myself to continue. As well as Bea and Ali, there was also Frankie and Bridget, a less traumatic ship for sure. While I didn't continue watching after season 5, I actually enjoyed this show more than Orange is the New Black precisely for the things that led to the tragic ending of the belly ship. The irony. Another show that I struggled with due to the ending was Pepper and Silva on Los Hombres de Paco, a Spanish serial drama starting in season 6 and culminating in an event in season 8 that no sapphic wanted. So why is this show and Wentworth nominated by you when it falls into one of the most hated lesbian tropes? I think it's a few reasons. It was my first time coming across a Spanish-speaking show with a major lesbian storyline. I think Ana and Teresa from the soap Amar en Tiempos Revueltos was the only other Spanish-speaking show on the air with a major sapphic storyline at the time, and Los Hombres de Paco allowed so much more physical affection than anything else I'd seen by the L word. It was at the same time as Otalia from Guiding Light was on the air, I talked about them in my previous video in this series, a pairing that was definitely suffering from the desexualized lesbian trope that was rampant at the time. Pepper and Silva didn't suffer from this, which made it a breakout success with the Women Love Women shipping community. However, the show wanted to go for the shock value and, well, the result was a tragic ending in the worst way possible, which is why I personally didn't recommend it or Wentworth in my other video. <laughs> Having said that, the ending notwithstanding, it was a great ship and groundbreaking in the Spanish-speaking sphere of sapphic representation on TV. I don't feel the same reservations when it comes to recommending Amara Muerte, a Mexican telenovela with a central lesbian storyline between Julia and Valentina from a few years back. While the title, which translates to love to death, doesn't necessarily engender confidence, the Women Love Women shipping community, having lived through enough dead lesbians, was very vocal about the importance of a happy ending and thank goodness the show listened. Of course, the show wasn't without its melodramatic ups and downs of which I could have done without a few of them, which is why it didn't get on my top 10 Women Love Women Soap and Telenovela ships video, but it was a wildly popular ship, especially with the younger crowd. And it may be to your taste as well. I was, however, a total goner for the Brazilian telenovela Em Familia and the Clara and Marina pairing that consumed my ship a heart in 2014. It wasn't the first lesbian storyline for the country. To my knowledge, there was Mujeres Apaccionadas, a very successful telenovela in 2003 with a teenage love story, and then Senoras do Destino in 2004, but I believe it was the first one to give us a lesbian kiss on Brazilian TV. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I love the Clarina ship because I'm a sap, and it was a slow burn, which I think is my Achilles heel, and it lingered in the softness of their developing feelings without throwing too much other drama at them. It was a simple and sweet love story that ended well, even if there were some painfully stilted moments due to the show's unwillingness to go beyond a kiss, which almost didn't happen due to religious pushback. Amar en Tiempos Revueltos, a Spanish soap, broke new ground in sapphic soap representation when it devoted two seasons to a main woman-love-woman -woman romance between Ana and Teresa. The show focused on the lives of a neighborhood in Madrid during the Spanish Revolution and beyond. Ana and Teresa's story went from 1950 to 1953 and followed as their friendship evolved into love over three years. They also made guest appearances a couple of times in later episodes, I think season 7. It's not a story for the faint of heart. There are a lot of tough things that happen to the two ladies, both from external forces and between them, but their feelings for each other was a shining beacon throughout it all. Again, it's a slow burn, and I would say that watching this as a super edit really is the only way to do it because there are something like 430 episodes to their storyline, and plenty of other characters in the mix too. Incidentally, in case you don't know, this show morphed into Amaras para Siempre, which gave rise to the sapphic ship Louis Melia. A special mention is Bad Girls. This popular UK show from the mid-aughts was nominated a few times in the comments, but I confess I only watched a few random clips of the show many years ago, so I don't feel like I can comment too much on the show, hence it being a special mention. It's set in a UK woman's prison and features a number of queer characters. That's it for the list. I know that there are many more wonderful TV shows that could be included, but I think I'll draw the line here. I'm currently working on putting together the script for a history of sapphic film and TV, which I'm finding fascinating, so I hope you'll subscribe to get notified for when that goes live. In the meantime, check out my other videos, and until next time, lady lovers.